Uh, welcome everybody. Um, today, today's talk is titled Air Ristal, a Mother Make Istal. So I'm also going to add another chameleon today. This time is a Lego one. Uh, thanks Lubos for the idea. And I'm Danilo Spinella. I've been software engineer in packaging for almost three years. And uh, I've been maintaining LibreOffice, MariaDB, and a couple of compression packages. So what are we going to talk about today? Today are we going to talk about this new tool that I've been working on the last years, which is called Aristal. It's uh, um, an alternative to make install for non-C projects. And today we are going to see, first of all, why, which I think is the first question that comes to everyone's mind, why develop a new tool, a new standard. Then we're going to see how it works and also how to integrate inside OpenSUSE and also other parts of the current uh, tool chain for development and uh, installation. So let's start. Why? This is the CanAdmin spec file. Uh, this is the package uh, um, and a software written by William Brown. Uh, the software is amazing. It does a lot of stuff. And it's also uh, full of small binaries. So it's uh, uh, all, all, each binary does a different thing, just uh, really simple. But as you can see, installation gets so big. This is just 50 lines of install section. We install all files manually. This is a, this is a Rust project, as you can see from the target release files. And uh, this, is, uh, this works. But at the same time, it has a, a couple of things that are not so good. First of all, this is prone to error, because uh, if you just install the one file in the wrong location, it's hard to go there and find it. Or if uh, you have to type 50 lines with the same macros all over again, it is really easy to get them wrong. Uh, one other important thing is that if we package Canadian for another distribution, then we need to rewrite the same 50 lines in another distribution. And maybe uh, we will be, it will be, for example, a package build. We need to write all the locations by hand. This gets even more prone to error. So this is something that I personally don't like. It works, but I wanted to see if there is any room for improvement. So let's see a couple of ideas on how to solve this. The first idea that comes to mind is just having a make install or a install.sh script. Why I, uh, I don't like this? The problem with make install is that we add another dependency on a Rust project, for example, like uh, we saw. Make doesn't allow, doesn't help the user writing the install phase because when you install on a Linux machine, on a Unix machine, you have to be aware of where the file should go. You have to be an expert in, for the hierarchy of the system. You have to know the GNU Linux, uh, GNU directory standard, which is huge, by the way. And this is something that also from to error, really long, you need to get the variables in make file right, which is something that uh, also really hard. This, the install.sh script is also something that we can do, but it has the same problem. It is not made, we, we need to write a script, we need to do it ourselves. It's something that is not standard and that maybe no other package uses. The next idea that we could have is, for example, using a full fledged build system, like Mason. Personally, it's the one that I prefer the most. It's, uh, it's really helpful to the developers, especially for the installation phase. But at the same time, it's another dependency. Maybe you're using another build system because the package that we are, we are developing or installing is not written in C. Maybe it's a NIM package. Maybe it's a cargo package. We need to call NIM package uh, manager. We need to call the cargo package manager. And then we need to have Mason on top of it. It gets even more complicated. So this is something that I consider, but I, I didn't like it that much either. The other e e option, um, I have a couple of, re of Rust projects, so I wanted to, to install them inside the system without having uh, 50 lines of install phases section. There is a cargo install command. The cargo install command is all installs binaries and libraries. So if you have, for example, complexions, documentation, main pages, all of them should be installed manually, which means we still have, we still need to write the install command, we still prone to error, and to be repeated across all distributions. The other problem is that it doesn't support workspaces. 
So for projects like Canadium, where it has 15 crates, 15 small binaries and libraries, you need to go inside each directory and call Calcoista manually, which is, it's not good in any way. So Calcoista doesn't have any support, and what I thought to do is to add a new file, a YAML file called istan.yaml, and I know it's a new standard, and I know what many people are thinking right now, and so I, I'm going to, first of all, to talk about what it is. It's a declarative installation file, and it tries to add complexity from the developer. Instead of saying where a file should be, you just say what kind of file we have. Do we have a binary? Okay, then our install will take care of where the binary should go. And it has a lot of complexity. You don't need to learn all the GNU directory standard. You don't need to rewrite install commands. It tries to fix these issues, and also fill the gap that we have currently. Yes, it's a new standard. We already have a lot of standards. And this is the relevant XK CD comics. I think it is always important to notice it. But at the same time, I think that if nothing fills the gap, it is still worth to pursue a new standard and try to, uh, to get feedback and inclusion. So, Let's dive directly into an install.yam file. As you can see, uh, this is a simple yam file, and we list each file depending on the type that we have. We have the binaries, for example. We have the executables. This case is a um, small Rust program. We have two binaries, wooPaperD and wooPaperCTL. Uh, and we just say, look, we have these two binaries we are not specifying where they should go. We never specify where they should go here, except for the uh, relative path. Um, we have the main pages, the licenses, the docs, the complexion as well. We have uh, all the four shells complexion. A couple of things to notice here. We have written type Rust, because uh, when we do that, I restyle automatically resolve the binary's location relative to target install, and we are going to see that afterwards in more detail. Also, we, uh, we can see a line, the first line is a error install declaration. We basically are asking error install to use the version 0.2.0. .0. I made this for compatibility reasons, because uh, I'm sure that in the future many more files will be supported, and I want to have backwards compatibility. I want the user to say, uh, these files will get installed inside user bin when was version 0.2.0. .0. Maybe in version 0.4, we will have a new type, or the same type will be installed in a different directory. This makes it easier to control for the users. L let's try to call it. Here we are calling a restall and uh, the install command. We're trying to install in, inside the system. And we only, have, we only want the compression for bash. We don't want the ZSH compression. We don't want the fish compression. So let's keep them. We are actually asking a restall to uh, install all the files that we saw before. So let's go quickly to the um, slide before. We have the uh, binaries, main pages, and the compression. And as you can see here, we have the binaries, uh, documentation, main pages, and compressions as well. And uh, user local.bin is the default directory for binaries. We didn't write that inside the istan.yaml. We didn't define it anywhere. The person that is developing the application didn't, uh, didn't need to define that. But it's there. And it tries to avoid and it hide a lot of complexity from the user. So we, thought, we say before about Rust projects. Why do we add a type to the restart? It should be agnostic, right? At the same time, there are a couple of things which are really common in some languages, like in Rust, every time we build a binary, is going to be installed inside the target release directory or target release with the arch. 
So we know where the fight is going to be. We don't need to fill the entire install.yam with target release prefix. We don't need that. It starts to become ugly, especially for projects like uh, Canadian, where they had 15 binaries, 15, 20 binaries. This becomes really tedious to do. So what, your, what our install does, basically, it translates all the binaries from there to target release and restall. It goes directly inside the target release directory, and if the file exists there, then it uses that file. Another problem that arises is that completions for Rust projects usually are built uh, build time, so we need to put them somewhere. We could put them inside the top directory, inside a complexion directory, but character is going to complain. The problem is that uh, when we publish a crate on uh, crates.io with cargo, it builds, we run the entire build process, and if the build process touch anything outside of target release, then cargo is going to say, no, this crate is not good to publish on crates.io. This is a security measure that they, they did, but at the same time, it uh, limits the developer, the developer to put complexion inside the top directory. So what happens is that we, put, we can put complexion inside the target release, and this still happens. So if we have, for example, um, if we go back, oh, sorry, I went too forward. So the, these two lines, these uh, two complexion files that you see here, they are not inside the top directory. They are inside target release, just like WPRD and WPRCTL. This way, we still have a lean istam.yaml file. We try to avoid repetition as well. We are doing a new standard just to avoid repetition. Why re re uh, uh, repeat a lot of things there? Doesn't make any sense. Same thing happens for, main, uh, for the two main pages. They are inside the target release uh, directory. How the build RS is written, uh, it's, I think it's outside of the scope, so I didn't post it here. But just to note that uh, uh, Rust is a first class uh, project for Aristotle. I'm looking forward to add new languages when uh, it gets more adoption. Uh, let's see how can we integrate this. The most important part for us is uh, the packaging. So we really want to see how we can integrate every cell inside a spec file. This is the spec file for WooPaperD. And as you can see, uh, we have the main package and the batch compression package. It builds using um, Cargo. We have just uh, three dependencies, Cargo, every cell, and SC doc for the main pages. Let's see. This is the rest of the spec file. We build the cargo project uh, like usually. We build the main pages here. And then we call this macro. We call the macro a restall. And also, we ask just for the compression for bash, because otherwise, we will get compression for other shells. Uh, we haven't packaged that yet. It's fine for us to just package bash for now. Uh, in the list of files, we do it as usual. We have the binary, the other binary, the main pages, and the bash compressions. Documentation here. Uh, we don't need to define the bin here. We saw before that, uh, sorry, that the default bin here is user local bin. So usually we'll, we'll need to define that inside the spec file. But at the same time, the Aristal macro does that for us. So if we Go step by step in the restall macro. We can see that they just call a restall inside the bin there. The install command. It does a restall that we are doing packaging. When we do packaging, we also require the SDR. We don't want to install inside the system. Uh, the packaging flag also had the system flag because we don't want to do a user installation when we're packaging, of course. And it sets basically the prefix, the lib dir, and all the default directories. We use the proper macro for that. This way, by just adding these 15 lines of macros, 
by adding the uh, install.yaml uh, section, we are trying to fill the gap and avoid any repetition because uh, all other distribution can just call this command here like that, and they are going to um, have the package installed automatically. But this, um, that wasn't enough for me. I know that, if, especially if you're de developing a new standard, just uh, um, one feature is not enough, especially for getting more adoption. So what I thought, what I thought was, uh, why don't we consider also user installations? I know that user installations are usually a frowned, uh, frowned upon, and I really get why, but many, many people are still going to GitHub releases, downloading a package from there, and installing it inside the home directory. So let's try to support that and improve the situation a little bit. This is the same common. Notice two things are missing from before. The system flag, because we are installing for the user, and the skip package config. I didn't mention it before. You are going to, we are going to see it here. All uh, files that are relevant for the user are getting installed. So the main pages are, aren't getting installed because usually, by default, when we do man, no local directory, uh, as far as I know, is getting searched. Just the system directories. So we are, Arista skips that, but he installed the documentation and the complexion along with uh, the binaries, which is what we need. Uh, what happens if we call a restall on 100 packages on the user, on the user directory? It gets so much uh, crowded, so many stuff there, there is no maintained by any package manager. And this is bad because if we need to update, then maybe some files get, uh, get removed from, from Upstream, but we still have them on our home directory. And if we want to have a home directory for 10 years, maybe this, uh, this could not be the right approach. What I did here is write a simple file called package info, which is just a YAM file, and it contains the list of files that will get installed. So all the files here, all this list of files with their location will be put inside this file. This way, we can have a couple of things. First of all, we know which files we, uh, this program installed. We can uninstall the package, and we can also update it. This is a, like a really small package manager and uh, while I still think that using a proper package manager, manager like Zipper or, um, or Pacman is definitely better, it's still better to give the tools to the user to at least have something in between, especially if they don't want to, um, or maybe if the package they want to install is not still in OBS, for example. This is the package config. And as you can see, uh, we have the path where this package config is installed and the list of files. From here, there are two things to notice, which are really, really important. Uh, first of all is the checksum, and the second thing is to replace. Every time we install a file, we do a checksum, and when we update it, we check the new file and the checksum for the new file. If the checksum are different, Maybe it's a configuration file, it, it got updated. Do we want to replace it with a new version? And this replace value told, uh, tell us if we can replace it or not. This is a binary. Even uh, if the binary, uh, the binary changes, it's okay, we, can, we just want a new version. But if a config file changes, we don't want to replace it. We are going to lose the files. So we don't want that. Uh, the other thing, that uh, I also try to fill the gap is, I saw a lot of projects that when they do releases on GitHub after a new version, they create a tarball. They compile the program and give the tarball to the users. But this process is also a front to error. They need to list all the files that uh, they want to have in the tarball, then the user need to unpack the tarball and they have the tarball, but they don't know how to install because there is no way how to install. So I also tried to fill this, this gap and uh, I added a turbo command. So basically it goes through all the files that we have inside the install.yaml and creates a turbo from that. What we can do from the turbo is we can uh, release it to the users, but we can also install from that without unpacking it. It basically goes through all the list of files and without unpacking it uh, inside a folder and installing it afterwards, directly install all the files on, in, into the system. And as you can see, uh, it still respects 
all the flags that we saw before, uh, user deer, um, sorry, bin deer, lib deer, it supports all the flags that we saw before. It's a full-fledged installation. Uh, what else? We also have a new install command. Uh, we can just remove the package. This is useful for me to try uh, packages, especially the one that I'm developing on to my system before creating the, the package uh, for the system. And uh, let's talk a little bit about future improvements. Uh, this tool has been in development for a couple of years. I tried to uh, get the ideas right before releasing it and getting more adoption, because uh, after we release it and uh, get wider adoption, it's, it is harder to fix things. It's harder to change the standard. So I wanted to know that what is done currently is worth it, is good, and will work in the future. Um, I really want this to work for five years. Uh, I don't want this to work for one month, and then we need to change the entire uh, format. It will, get no, it will get no meaning to do that. Other things that can be done is integrating this more into OBS. I know there are a lot of uh, projects that could benefit from this. Especially projects, for example, that uh, are not C, uh, C project, are not Rust. Maybe they're just uh, configuration files. Maybe they are just some scripts to install. Why do we need make in that case? We could fill the gap with this. Uh, other improvements will be to polish it a little bit. There's still roof around the edges. We can improve something about the, um, uh, the command line, uh, the user interface. We can add more files, because uh, there's always some new file that gets installed into a weird directory. And it's hard to support otherwise. Um, and I think also getting feedback is the most important uh, part of this talk, getting feedback on the standard, getting more packages to know what they think about it, if we can get more inclusion, and more testing on OBS. We can add an install file, use the install macros, and uh, first of all, we reduce a lot of code there, we improve the packages, and we can also see how it works and if they do the global testing there. If we can get this to work also on uh, packages that release the tarball, that would also improve things further. So that was it for uh, this talk. Thank you for your attention. Uh, is there any question? I, I stand there. <laughs> you handle a path that needs to be known in the compile time, for example, um, path of con configuration files for passed to supplementary binaries or data? So the, the thing is that uh, um, usually uh, Arista is meant to fill the gap when there is no configure. So when you, for example, build a Rust package or you have some scripts, there is no configure to set the installation uh, directory. So for binaries, you don't know where there is going to be. So uh, when you call Arista, you're going to set the correct uh, arguments for being there, and you install them. Getting, uh, getting to know things at compile time, maybe what can be used, if, for example, when you run configure, use the bin there, and then you call a restart with the same bin there. Currently, there is no way to, um, to get the bin there from somewhere. But this is something that we can look, definitely look into and uh, look at the different edge cases that we have. Uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. But for example, uh, check uh, path to configure file, you need to know in compile, in compile time, otherwise the binary will not find it. Uh, yes, this is true, but it's also an issue of the, uh, <laughs> this is also an issue regarding the build system. This doesn't build the, the code. So getting um, the correct paths inside the binaries is um, the responsibility of the build system. So it's something that starts before. Uh, I think this is my opinion, but we could definitely look into this. Th thank you, thank you, Sandra, for the question. Any other question? Yes. Uh, do you realize that make is part of POSIX? And so, yeah. how that's like selling the you are selling the tool as if here we have some software you don't need an operating system, something like that. Um, if you have make, then you have something that can do declarative uh, in a similar way. So half the problem is solved. There is a need for a standard maybe, but I think that installing something written in 
yet another programming language is actually adding not one but two problems. Okay. So I, uh, this is a really good point. The thing is that I've been, uh, uh, before joining SUSE, I was packaging my free time for Exerbo, and uh, with Exerbo, you really need to get the prefix and all the variables right, otherwise it, get not, it doesn't get installed, because it has a little bit different variables for installing. So I look into a lot of Mac files, and uh, at least 50% of them didn't get the variables right for installing it. So yes, make is available, it's POSIX, but it's uh, not made for installing. We install with that, we build with that, it's, it's true that we do that, but when you install, we need to define the variables in the correct way, which is hard, uh, especially, for example, getting the prefix. We need to define prefix in a correct way so that it gets the, environment, the environmental variable, but it can also get um, um, replaced when we call make. It's something that is really, really hard. I, it's in my opinion. I saw a lot of make files, and uh, it's really, really hard to get it right. Uh, th th so there is a proper way to do that, of course, and it's not entirely intuitive, perhaps, to write make files. But the point is you can make it declarative in a way that the user, the, the developer doesn't need to know any of that. You just declare, my program has like uh, auto make, but you can do it with plain make. Uh, you declare which programs you want to install, which documentation, and then uh, you have a make file uh, that simply imports your uh, definition and it installs and the user doesn't really need to know anything it just works in that and uh, there is uh, a couple of details like for example the variable replacement you don't want that because uh, different environments may define things slightly different like if you are using an operating system like Windows, may, maybe it doesn't come with make, but there is a make for Windows. And if you happen to use that implementation, which is slightly incompatible, um, there could be variables that you don't know about in this other system, or there could be, I don't know, Haiku or whatever. You don't really know what that does on the system, but you want to avoid getting those from the, uh, from the environment. So, Normally, you don't take environment variables un unless they have a very uh, standard meaning, like, for example, path. Okay, okay, Th these are a good point. I wasn't aware that make was, a very, um, uh, was possible to do that in make. Uh, I, I thought it was still good to pursue a new standard and try to think of it. I'm, uh, I'm not saying that this is the, the, uh, the finished uh, standard that we need to use that uh, at all cost. It's still good to see if, uh, how does it compare with make. At the same time, I think that there are a lot of um, standard variables that we are there used, like a prefix, bin dear, uh, doc dear, all these variables. Uh, these are the ones that I was uh, referring to. I, I wasn't uh, really clear with that. No, uh, but I mean, if, if you, you don't want to take variables like prefix from the environment, you want that specified on the command line. But why, why don't we want to take it from the environment? Because it could, so you can accidentally define those and then have it taken into the build system. It's true, this is also really true, but if we think about RPM build, every time we call it RPM build, we, we have the, the correct prefix set. And I'm, uh, my assumption when going to this is that every time we call make, we have the correct uh, environment variables because we are inside the build process or for, for example, for packaging. You're assuming that there's one use for that, but composition is another, and you could have this infrastructure call from another thing. And that could potentially add, for example, you can have uh, another make file calling into your make file, and it will have variables defined, but maybe the same as yours, but you don't want to take that. If you define those with uh, a question mark equal, it will take that, yes, and probably yes. that's wrong. Uh, if you uh, use the standard equal, then the only way to override that from the other make is to pass it on the command line. Uh, thank you, thank you. I, I think that uh, getting from environmental variable, uh, all the packages that I've seen un until now was good, 
But that's also another good point. Thank you for the question. I, there's also Simon that wanted to do a question before the talk's end. So I'm going to agree with the previous person and say that command, as someone who maintains CMake, command line parameters are much better than environment variables. And so I think that would be a good enhancement in the future to um, support command line parameters. And if maybe if the command line parameter doesn't exist, then use the environment variables. And then for your OBS macro, you use the command line arguments instead of environment variables. And everything works because in your, in your user install case, you don't know what environment variables the user may or may not have installed. On OBS for your system case, yes, we do. But in the user case, you don't. Um, second, completely different question. What does the dash dash yes, yes flag do? Uh, so to answer, uh, thank you for the questions. So to answer the first one, uh, the environmental variables uh, we were referring to make file because uh, Aristal doesn't read the environmental variables, it only supports for uh, command line arguments, which, uh, which is why I totally agree with you that uh, they are better than reading for the environment. Uh, for the second one, um, the, without the double, uh, uh, double dash yes, it runs in a dry mode, dry run mode, so you can see what files will be installed. Uh, if you run... Uh, Yes, then you're accepting the changes and it will start inside the system. So that's the opposite way to most things that have a dash dash don't do anything flag. Uh, yeah, but I wanted the other way around. Uh, but it's also a good point. Thank you. That's technically against uh, Unix philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, a last um, feature request, let's say. Uh, would it be possible for us to, and I can work with you on that if you, if you, if you'd like that. But, uh, for us to populate the file section automatically, because I thought, I thought the problem I have with packaging many times is not just getting the install section right. It's also, oh, now I have to figure out all these files. And if I could get that out from the output of, of our install, then that would be one line maybe that I could just slurp the file into, into the file section as we do for some packages. And that would be two problems solved with one tool. So this is an amazing question because this, uh, I implemented that in the past. I was talking with Antonio about that uh, yesterday. The issue with that is that uh, I, can, I can print out the list of files, but usually a lot of packages are divided into sub-packages. And a restall doesn't have this comp system, or you can have sub-packages inside a restall, but they wouldn't uh, be the same with all distributions. And um, the other issue is that when I expand, the, the variables, I don't know about RPM macros, so you are going to get the list of files without the RPM macros, for example, for being there and so on. So you get the entire path, and then you need to change it back to the macros. So this is the issue that I had. I implemented a simple command to print the file section, then I remove it afterwards. But this is uh, really good. If we can get it working, that will be also a good improvement. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Martin. Um, OK, I think there is no time any, anymore. Um, we still Last have other, like we still have other questions, so there will be like a few breaks. Okay, Do perfect. Ah, okay, Christian, please. Why don't you uh, produce LPM packages directly? Uh, so, so is, did you ever think to create LPM packages directly from our install? Uh, uh, why, why to go over LPM build? You have all the information there. Just create a CPO archive, some headers, and you have an LPM package. I never, didn't ever think of that, but it would be amazing to have, yeah. especially for Why projects. not? Yeah, yeah, that would be quite, quite uh, good to have. That, that is good. Uh, Thank you. I would like to comment that there is no need to uh, translate back from the full path to the uh, RPM macros. There are packages that uh, provide file lists, and if you generate file lists, uh, then for the simple, pack simple packages that aren't split, you could just use that. Uh, There's also a really good point. Uh, I didn't think about that, but it's something that uh, I would definitely look into. Thank you. Uh, la last thing. Uh, there is some packages that actually do, do that exactly with auto tools. They build directly. And the second thing is you should consider uh, so something that is not normally implemented on the either the systems are self-contained or they are um, on the on the host. There is a case for, and there's very few that support that, uh, of using both 
uh, the self-contained build system and the host, and looking at which version is newer, because you may want that. Okay, there's something else to look into. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, thank you, thank you everybody.